Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed your break and perhaps a Zumba session. Um, I want to welcome you to our first round of workshop for the morning. Um, this is starting a school-based health center 101 and our presenter today is Amy Ranger, who is a director of programs with the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, before we get started, I do want to read the instructions um, so that way we can try to avoid <laughs> some of the technology uh, challenges from this morning. So. Um, you are to try to click on um, the, the browser here. Um, refresh your browser um, and then click on the standalone player under the screen to open up to another window. Um, and then you can go ahead and close your original browser. Um, so hopefully people were able to see that in the main lobby chat all morning. I know those instructions were um, being repeated, but I wanted to go ahead and repeat that this morning as well. Um, so that way we can have as smooth as possible of a workshop um, with our wonderful presenter today, Amy. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn off my camera and stop talking and turn over to Amy to get us started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Yes. Ditto to that. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully this will work. Um, I want to um, just especially start out with a thank you for everyone's resilience. It has been a little bit more stressful of a morning than we anticipated. Um, it's our first time on the Feed Loop platform. And um, any of you who were in the opening plenary know we had a lot of technological challenges. Um, and so I myself am just settling into the first workshops. Um, I also just spilled water all over my desk. <laughs> but Sang reminded me that we are a resilient group um, and that everyone is happy to be here and that everyone is bringing all of their patience and love for this field. So big thank you to all of you for joining us today and apologies again for the bumpy start that we had. Hopefully that was the end of that and we're on a good path now. Um, Sang, just quickly, you are seeing the front slide, correct? Correct. Awesome. Okay. So um, just a reminder that I can't see chat or um, anything else. So just tell me if you need me to pause for any reason. Um, so welcome again. My name is Amy Ranger, which Sam just said. I'm the Director of Programs of the California School-Based Health Alliance. And I'm doing our workshop today on School-Based Health Centers 101. So basically like how you might think about even beginning to start a school-based health center um, in your region, in your field, in your school. Um, so we have a quick poll question we're starting out with, which is just sort of um, uh, saying we'll launch it, but it's basically, are you coming from a school slash LEA um, school district? Are you coming from a community health center slash federally qualified health center? Or are you coming from a different organization altogether? I think that was the first poll. Is that correct, Sang? Yes, I had to get myself back on the unmute page. Great. <laughs> Take your time. Um, well, while everyone is answering the poll questions, I'll talk a little bit about CSHA and then Sing can report back what answers we get from the poll. So for those of you who don't know us um, or who didn't hear the blurb in the beginning of the plenary session, the California School-Based Health Alliance is a nonprofit throughout the entire state of California. Um, we are not part of the state government, but we work really closely with different offices in state government, including the California Department of Public Health and the California Department of Education. Um, but we are our own freestanding nonprofit and we work um, to help new school-based health centers start, um, mostly by matching up schools and school districts with community partners, either health or mental health partners, to come together to start school-based health centers. Or we work with existing school-based health centers to um, improve their services, expand their services, um, sustain their services um, more fully. So we both try and launch new ones as well as to um, support the existing school-based health centers in California. Um, and if you're not a member of our organization, we highly um, encourage you to become one, especially if you currently run school-based health centers. Um, it does give you a registration discount as well as um, extra technical assistance and is a great way of supporting school-based health centers across California. Um, so I think I'll stop there saying and ask if we, yeah, have, oh, we have Yeah, we have 16 votes already. Um, we have 45 participants, so hopefully we'll get a few more in and then we'll um, let you know who's in the room. It sounds good. Probably people are just still getting their water after Zumba. I hope that was fun. I love the brain breaks. 
Um, so my objective for this morning is really just to um, provide you all with tools to launch your first steps in your school-based health center planning process. Um, and we will be doing Q&A throughout. I thought I would do sort of chunks around different subtopics and then pause for questions. So definitely want to hear any and all questions that you have. So starting with the basics um, and saying feel free to jump in at any point. Um, what is a school-based health center? For those of you who don't know, um, oh, and in fact, I think we have a second poll question. So saying when you get answers from the first one, maybe you can ask the second one too, which is sort of where are people at in their planning process? Do they run school health centers already? Are they planning them? Are they like not even sure what this is and they're just here to learn? So once we get through the first poll, we can do the second one as well. So, okay. Do you want me to go ahead and just um, share out the results and then we can then move on to the second poll? Sure. Sounds great. Okay, so we have a total of 19 votes and 47.4% of people are from a school or LEA, 42.1% are from a community health center or FQHC, and then 10.5% are um, from others. So it looks like, um, you know, a little bit higher on the school end, which is great um, because mm -hmm. I think this is a fitting workshop for all of you, as well as for our FQHC members. So I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, enable the second poll. Perfect. Thank you. And yes, I love hearing that we have a mixture of both because, like I said in the beginning, one of the um, essential first steps to starting new school based health centers is taking school district and school partners and matching them up with community health center and community mental health partners and coming together to launch school based health centers. So that seems really fitting that we're sort of half and half. Um, so, what is a school-based health center? By our definition, um, school-based health centers deliver some kind of primary medical care plus other services. So we'll go deeper into services in a minute, but that can be dental and oral health, that can be um, uh, mental health, that's one of the deepest needs, uh, sexual and reproductive health, health education, some even have vision services. So the idea is to have a multidisciplinary team, not just one kind of service, but multiple kinds of services together, and then either on or near a school campus. And we'll talk some more about um, those definitions as well, because we have mobile units and we have school linked health centers. Um, but the whole point is that they have to have some kind of relationship with the school. Um, serving students and often um, siblings, family members, and the community, and then promoting school-wide health. And I particularly like this one because I think one of the beautiful things about school-based health centers is that they aren't just a standalone clinic that happens to sit on a school base, a school campus, but instead they're really integrated into the school to help help think more broadly about health in the broader school community. So there are 293 school-based health centers in California. This map shows you where they are. Um, you can see that historically they're mostly located in the most urban regions of San Francisco, Alameda County, and Los Angeles. However, in recent years, um, growth has, off, has mostly happened in the Central Valley. Of the last 35 school-based health centers, 25 have been in the Central Valley, which is great, and we love that. Um, and we're doing more investment right now in San Bernardino and Riverside counties because that's one of the places with the deepest need. So we're excited to see school-based health centers continue to grow. Um, 293 is awesome, and we were at 176 in 2010, so you can see that there's been a lot of growth in the last 10 years, which is awesome, but so much more growth to go, because as you may know, there's about 10,000 schools in California, and obviously not everyone can or should have a school-based health center, but we need a lot more than 293. Um, at CSHA, one of our goals is to get to 500 in the next, I want to say, 10 years. So we are actively working on um, getting state and federal level investment to help launch new school-based health centers, as well as to help find tools to make the school-based health centers sustainable once they do get launched. And saying, do we have a um, response from the second poll? Yeah, um, we have 16 votes. 31% um, are currently running school-based health centers. 25% are planning new school-based health centers, which is very exciting to see, and 43.8% are new to the model or curious to learn. Awesome, that's so exciting, yeah. If you are currently running school-based health centers and have some wisdom and some insight to offer, by all means, chat it in. Um, and if you are not, or even if you are and you have questions, absolutely share those as well, and we'll address those as we go. 
Um, so generally what services are provided at a school-based health center, and this seems important because sometimes people hear about school-based health centers and they think, oh, it's like a school nurse. And, you know, we love school nurses and work really closely with the California School Nurses Organization. But a school-based health center is bigger and more and more interdisciplinary than just school nursing. So um, indeed, most of them do have medical services. Um, most have mental health, and we see this as, as um, our plenary speaker, speaker mentioned, one of the deepest needs in kids and adolescents in California is those mental health services. 65% um, have dental prevention, and then you can see at the bottom, 35% have dental treatment. And that has been expanding more over the last couple of years. So you can see that picture is of a full dental operatory. 60% um, offer reproductive health, but that's a little bit of a skewed um, statistic because some only serve little kids. So some don't have reproductive health because they don't have any patients that would need it. And then a little over half have some kind of youth engagement activities. And we'll talk more about what those look like in a minute. Um, a total of 286,000 young people have access to school-based health centers in California, which is great. Although, as we said earlier, not nearly enough. So who is served? So as I mentioned, not all of them serve all ages. Um, about 50%, a little less than 50% are in high schools. A little over a quarter are in elementary schools. Um, only 11% are in middle schools, but that's because there's fewer middle schools in California. And then 16% are either mobile and go to multiple schools or they're school linked. And oftentimes school links also serve multiple schools, like we'll be on a campus that straddles multiple schools. Um, interestingly enough, 83% serve more than just their students. Um, so this doesn't necessarily mean the full community because oftentimes they don't have enough providers and space to serve the full community. Um, sometimes they do, but sometimes it will be like students and siblings or students and family members or students and then students from a feeder school, but something that's beyond just the students at that school. Um, and mostly I think this is about access and that the community health centers want to provide as much access as they can, as they can given their um, staffing and their facilities. And it's also about sustainability. Um, so if you have a broader patient base, then it's easier to make sure that the clinic can stay busy um, all day, every day. So this seems important um, because who runs the school-based health center is really going to define the structure and the um, financing of the school-based health center. So more than half, about 55%, are run by community health centers. And almost all of those are what we call FQHCs. So for those of you who aren't in this world already, federally qualified health centers. Um, a little over a quarter of them are run directly by school districts, and then um, the rest are run by di a whole different, um, all kinds of things. We just lump them all together in that category. So it could be hospital run, um, county health department, youth development agency, community-based mental health agency. There are other models, um, but most are run by community health centers or school districts. But as we'll talk about in a second, what's really important is that these they are all partnerships. So even if they're run by a community health center or a school district or a mental health agency or a, a youth development agency, all those people come together in each school-based health center because one agency can't do it alone. It has to be lots of different folks coming together in partnership to make a full-fledged clinic. So, um, it's been proven by a number of different studies, and I'll go into the research in a second, but that they are indeed an effective approach to health and education equity um, for a few different reasons. Meeting students where they're at just really makes sense. Of course, if you think about it, like if students are going to be at school every day, hopefully, then we want to come to them and bring the services to them to break down any and all barriers, right? We don't want any cost barriers. We don't want insurance barriers. And then just being there physically really helps, I think, reduce some of the logistical barriers of transportation and taking time out and having parents having to take time off of work. Um, also, I think it reduces a lot of the stigma barriers when you have a school-based health center where people know they can go because they sprain their ankle or because they need a Band-Aid. It also means you can go for sexual and reproductive health services and for mental health services. Um, services that you might have more stigma or concern about accessing if they were um, at a different location. Also, um, the integration between the school and the community health care partners means that there can be that sharing of strategies and information and reaching out and wrapping our arms around the 
uh, the kids and the students. So when something's happening in school, a referral can be made directly to that mental health provider or to that medical provider and vice versa. Um, there are concerns about information sharing, um, which we'll talk about HIPAA and FERPA, but, um, but just the fact that you have these two different really important sort of domains in a child's life working together means that we can meet the needs of children so much more deeply. Um, also, it's a whole child approach, which is really in line with like a full service community schools approach, um, looking not just at the academic needs of a student, but at their physical needs, their mental needs, their social and emotional health, um, all of those pieces, plus the sort of like peer um, and adult relationships of youth development programs, um, putting all those pieces together, social determinants of health and having um, meeting other needs that students might have in terms of food security or housing or legal issues, all those things can come together in one place. So here's some of the research and we can give you these citations if you need them, but school based health centers have been proven to increase seat time, which decreases absenteeism, which of course those of you in the school world know means more funding for schools. Um, increased access to health care, um, especially for um, kids who have uh, not enough insurance or aren't connected to a PCP, also specifically around um, health care services that aren't sort of primary care, so things around mental health or sexual and reproductive health or oral health. Um, so lots of different studies have shown that having a school-based health center on a student's campus means they are much more likely to get the health care that they need. Um, also, Students with a school-based health center are 10 to, there's two different studies, 10 to 21 times more likely to use mental health services. And I think that's partially about stigma and it's partially about access, but that's huge, right? Like so much more likely to get those services they need. Um, also less emergency room utilization for students with asthma because you can do some of that preventative and treatment work rather than waiting to go to the emergency room. Um, having school-based health centers on a campus has been shown to increase feelings of school connectedness for students. Um, and then also reducing risky behaviors. And that especially was shown to be true in with our LGBTQ youth um, in terms of um, risky behaviors around sexual health. And then I have to actually, we learned, um, show you the video in a different screen. Um, but we usually are able to um, get tours when we when we have these conferences in person we do this workshop and then we all go together to a school based health center to see it in action but of course this is our virtual world um so i have some videos for you and i'm going to play one now um that goes through a couple different school based health centers in oakland well oakland and san leandro all run by the same agency so we're gonna not watch this full video but the first like three minutes of it or no that's not true sorry that's the other video we are gonna watch the full four minutes um and saying can you see the big pink screen Yes. Okay, then I will start it off. Tell me if you can't hear it or something. I've been doing this type of work for many years. And what I have seen during that period of time in terms of the issues affecting our children, our most at-risk kids, are experiences and challenges that it is difficult for me to summarize, to some people, to even begin to explain the level of trauma, the level of, of psychosocial crises that these kids are facing. A lot of our students come from neighboring communities, and a lot of the communities that are around school-based health centers deal with challenges around poverty, around unstable home situations, around lack of access to nutritious foods, um, to violence. And so we're able to see that, and we and provide interventions that really do address those needs. A lot of our students may have never seen a doctor. A lot of them have never received basic care. And it's very important for them to be able to come to La Clinica and get the services that they need. Hi, I'm Karen Gold. I'm the nurse practitioner. I'll be working with you today. A school-based health center is a health center that provides health care services at the school site and is able to reach students directly because they're at a school site. So we serve as a medical home and a reproductive health care home for many of the young people in our community. We serve as a mental and behavioral health home for many of our young people. And that is one of the most important because there is a very large gap in mental health resources for young people. And very important, we also serve as a dental home for our young people, as well as opportunities for youth leadership and development through our peer health, education, training, and our outreach efforts. I 
as a parent, having the option to come to a school-based health care facility uh, is priceless. What is your daughter's name? This is close to her school, so she can come right out of class and come down here, or she can come during the school day if need be, and not miss, you know, a great part of her, her learning time. Health issues are always connected to academic performance, just because students can have eye problems and they can't see the board, and therefore they're not doing well, or they have hearing problems and they can actually hear the teacher, and therefore aren't getting all of the material, or they have dental problems that distracts them from being able to concentrate on their, on their work, or just minor pains. And for teachers to be able to kind of semi-recognize that there's something more going on and be able to immediately refer students to a clinic, that's really important because we're able to address their minor health problem and not have it deeply impact their academic success. I'm a product of having a, a, a clinic in the neighborhood and, and, and I have a full-time job and I'm healthy. And when I have kids, I'm gonna make sure that my kids is healthy. And all of that comes from having different programs. We have different programs by people support. And so when you have different people supporting, that's putting money into different programs that's going to help the neighborhood. In that neighborhood, you are building young people who are taking pride in themselves and taking pride in who they are and, and, and getting help with themselves. And then we're going to be the people who are going to become doctors. We're going to be teaching their kids about how to take care of themselves. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. We are very deliberately placing our centers in communities that have some of the worst health outcomes, that have some of the worst psychosocial stressors, meaning violence, drugs, poverty. All of those issues affect the well-being of a child. When you invest in a school-based health center, you're not necessarily investing in an organization or an institution. You're really, truly investing in the well-being of children. Um, okay, so I think I will, um, saying just double checking, we're back to the slides. Um, and then I think I'll pause right there just to see if there's any, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, it's, uh, it's still showing your, oh, there it is. Okay, I forget about the 10 second delay. Oh, right, <laughs> so tricky. Um, okay, so we should be on um, a model about more than healthcare, that's public health. Um, but I thought I would pause here just to see if there's any sort of initial questions about services, structure, California school based health centers, um, and then we'll dive a little bit more deeply into some of the elements, especially financing. Any questions from anyone so far? Um, there were a few questions in the chat. Um, I, I somewhat responded to them. One was about the data being specific to the to California. So I said yes, and we'll share the national data from the census report. Um, and then um, uh, the link to the video, which I popped into the chat. But I think that's all for now. OK, great. Then I'll keep going. But definitely feel free to stop me if there's anything that people want to discuss. Um, so I mentioned this briefly earlier, but I think what's truly amazing to me about this model, because, you know, healthcare is great and everyone deserves access to healthcare and we all should have a primary care provider. And if we needed a therapist and a dentist, you know, we all need all of our healthcare needs taken care of. Um, but what is incredible to me about school-based health centers is that it's really more than just about healthcare on a school campus. It's about a public health model. So some um, examples of how this plays out are that some school-based health centers are seeing, you know, over 90% of the student body at some point during the course of the year. And one of the ways that they do that is the next point, which is around screenings. So they'll have sort of, uh, it happens in different ways at different schools, depending on how big they are and what services they have. But for example, you might have every single ninth grader in their health class come into the school based health center to just ch spend 10 minutes with a provider having a one-on-one -on -one conversation to say like, hey, how are you doing? Do you have a doctor? Do you have health insurance? Are you up to date on your vaccines? Um, you know, are you sexually active? Is there anything going on at home? Just sort of a general screening to make sure that young people don't have any unmet needs that they are sitting on and not ad getting addressed. Um, so, so that's an amazing way to sort of find these 
every time I've heard of this happening, something comes up where it's like, oh, we didn't know this kid really did need counseling, or we didn't know this person needed emergency contraception, or we didn't know this person is having food insecurity and needed a referral to the food bank. So every time this happens, it feels like we're able to find needs that we didn't know existed in the student body and start to meet those needs, which of course makes such a difference for those young people. Um, another example of the public health model in action are these sort of like making sure that everyone has holiday food, having clothing or jackets, having school supplies at the beginning of school, um, sort of looking for those more sort of social determinants of health needs that students and families might have and using the school-based health center as a way to find those, especially in schools that don't have sort of robust parent centers or family centers or full service community schools. Also, a lot of school-based health centers do health fairs and wellness campaigns. They can do this for the students, for the staff, for the families, for the broader community, you know, booths and taste tests and um, fun activities, things like that as part of a, an event on campus. Um, also, school-based health centers can do amazing staff wellness activities, and this can be about nutrition and physical activity, but it can also be about mindfulness and self-care or yoga or mental health or you know, stopping smoking or whatever it is that staff need um, to sort of be as well as they can be so that they're bringing their best selves to the school as well. Um, School-based health center staff, especially the behavioral health providers, often participate in PBIS and cost support. Cost for those of you who don't have one, the coordination of services team. So a chance for all the different service providers on a campus to come together and do case management and make sure that um, referrals are coming in and getting delegated to one of the providers and that every kid is being, being held and not falling through the cracks. Also professional development, right? Staff and teachers often have lots of great questions about health, um, about substance use or about mental health or about family violence or how health impacts learning or, you know, whatever. And we have um, health and mental health practitioners and providers on campus that can provide that professional development to staff and teachers, which can be a really valuable partnership. Um, and then youth engagement. So I imagine that we all believe deeply in youth development and youth engagement and believe that young people deserve that, those peer, that opportunities for peer engagement and the opportunities for adult and young people engagement together um, to support their growth and their leadership and their voice. Um, and to create that space for young people. So this can often happen, as you saw in one of the first slides, over 50% of school-based health centers have some kind of youth development or youth engagement program. So that can look like a peer health education program where young people are training their peers, either through workshops or um, loudspeaker announcements or poster campaigns or whatever it might be. They, they pick topics that are most relevant to them and then train their peers. So sometimes that's about, you know, why it's important to use a condom or how to say no to sex or sometimes it's important why not to drink and drive or um, how to quit vaping or how to have healthy relationships, you know, whatever it is that they decide is the most important thing in their community, and then they make sure they have the information and the content knowledge and then spread it to their peers. Also, youth, youth advocacy projects, if young people think that something needs to change in their, either their school or their broader community, we've seen amazing um, examples of young people getting, you know, fruits and vegetables into their corner stores or getting tobacco products not marketed to young people in their corner stores or getting um, free breakfast at their school if they don't already have that. Um, just looking for opportunities to improve their community for their fellow peers. Um, research teams, um, community-based participatory research, having young people ask a question and then do deep research to get an answer to that question, which often then leads to the advocacy projects because once they answer the question then they want to solve the problem. Also youth advisory boards, making sure that the school-based health center is accountable to the young people, that they have, um, you know, even just the things as simple as the, the, the posters on the wall and the brochures that they're distributing are things that young people feel like are relevant. Um, also, young people can be the most productive and effective ambassadors to your school-based health center. So if you're thinking about starting a school-based health center, having a youth advisory board be your sort of like loudspeakers about that to their peers is going to be really effective, especially when it's true that you can say like, oh, this is a really youth-friendly place and our staff really love working with young people and we really believe in confidentiality and here's how the laws about confidentiality work and you can count on us to follow those laws. 
then young people can vouch for your services to their peers and say, yeah, no, it really is a safe place to go. And they really are nice. And like, they'll give you a tampon and they don't make fun of you and they don't call your parents about this and this and this, but they do tell your parents about this and this and this. Like when the, when the young people are grounded in what confidentiality looks like, then they are much more able to convince their peers. And then lastly, health career pipeline projects, right? We know we need so many more um, health providers in this country and in this state, and we definitely need more um, health providers of color and that come from our communities. So um, having pipeline projects where young people can learn about how to be a nurse practitioner, how to be a doctor, how to be a therapist, how to be a dentist, how to be a medical assistant or a dental hygienist, any of those things where they can get that training in the school-based health center or through the broader lead agency and then go on to further schooling so that they can come back and work in these communities. Like Those are so powerful. Um, and there's often funding available for those projects as well, which is great. Um, so I mentioned this at the beginning, but I think it's really important that school-based health centers just don't work unless they are partnerships, right? They are inherently partnerships because they have to be a partner between the school and the school district and the clinic provider. But also, ideally, they would be multiple kinds of community partners, right? You might have um, a mental health agency that's providing mental health services, an FQHC that's providing medical services, um, the public health department might come in and provide services, um, you might have a youth development organization that wants to do your youth advocacy project or bring in an AmeriCorps provider. Um, if you can pull lots of different kinds of organizations together and have them work together well, that's going to be the way to have the most sustainable and the most um, well-rounded school-based health center you can get. Um, and really, it has to be integrated into the school environment. Otherwise, um, you're not going to get young people there. You're not going to get buy-in from teachers and staff and administrators. But you have to figure out how to make the clinic really infuse into the school and vice versa, rather than just sort of plopping a clinic onto a school campus. So some of the ways to do that coordination, um, from the front end, you really wanna have a strong memorandum of understanding. And we have samples of this for you and we can talk you through this, um, but getting really clear from the beginning, what is the school gonna provide? What are the different community agencies gonna provide? Um, how is information sharing gonna work? Because as you may know, there's a HIPAA laws that talk about how healthcare providers can um, share information. And there's FERPA laws about how school staff can provide information. And those, those laws often don't um, come together very well. I mean, that's fine, we can work around that, but we have to talk about that in the beginning so that no one is confused or surprised that it's not just a simple straightforward sharing of information. Um, also having those monthly partner meetings to just talk about how things are going, what's working, our students coming, our families coming, what is the health uh, provider seeing in terms of need, um, what amazing sort of campaigns can happen together, what new services are we going to provide, all those kind of things to, to, have, to have time for that communication between the school administrators and the clinic administrators. Um, and then, like I was talking about earlier, the coordination of services team, that's um, it, the partner meetings are more like administratively what's happening with services. The coordination of services team are, having, are talking about what is happening with individual young people, right? So this teacher identifies this student needs this kind of service, or maybe they don't even know what kind of service they need. They just know that they're suddenly falling asleep in class or acting out or, you know, holding their cheek like they have a toothache, whatever it is. So the teacher is referring to the coordination of services team, and then those people are saying, okay, here's what seems to be happening for the student. Let's make sure they get connected. And then the next week, okay, did they get connected? Do they need anything else? Are they doing okay? Like, what do they need? So just making sure that every single student need gets addressed in a timely manner by the team. And then that same sort of teacher, staff, outreach, and professional development. Um, it's tricky because from a healthcare provider standpoint, right, the focus is on sustainability and seeing patients for health services and billable visits. So making sure that, you know, that nurse practitioner or that LCSW is seeing a certain number of students a day to make sure that, the, you know, as many students as possible get seen and that they are able to bill enough to, to sustain their own salary and, and the clinic itself. But it's really valuable to make sure that some of the clinic time is carved out for non-billable services to reach out to teachers, to staff, to do those trainings, to have those meetings, to talk about services and what they're seeing, to come to staff meeting, that sort of thing. 
Um, and then students access, making sure that students can actually get to the clinic, um, which means like physically, how do they get to the student clinic? Like, can they walk there? Is there a gate? Is there a locked door? And then do they need a pass? How do they tell their, their teacher that they're going? Do they get um, their absences uh, cleared, especially for sensitive services and confidential services so that an absentee does, call doesn't get made to their parents? Um, and then in terms of parental consent, because we know, right, that some services can be seen under just students' consent, so things for like reproductive and sexual health, but many services like primary care or even like I need Tylenol or I fell down and scraped myself, like that sort of service needs parental consent. So you want to get those consents before they need help. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is to use school registration to get all those parental consents signed for clinic access so that when the kid does sprain their ankle, the, you know, we're going to call home to the parent anyway to say, hey, Johnny sprained their ankle, but you want to be able to start wrapping the ankle and icing the ankle and, you know, doing what you need to do because you know you have a consent on file and then following up with the parents. Also, teachers and staff have to get TB tests, which is such a pain. So if they can just get that done at the school-based health center, that lends a lot of goodwill. Um, I want to talk about telehealth for a minute because this has come up a lot during COVID um, and because there's new telehealth providers in the world that are um, marketing themselves to, school, to schools as a solution to these health problems. Um, and we at CSHA don't think that telehealth is necessarily good or bad it in and of itself, but we do think that there are good and bad ways to do it. And actually saying, because our moderator is um, working on a, a sort of white paper to explain some of our guidance. Um, but I think what's most important is about what we think is important is that telehealth providers need to be grounded in the community. So it's great if your local FQHC is gonna have a school-based health center and then be able to maybe do telehealth with the feeder middle school or um, they're gonna bring in telehealth on the days that the school-based health center isn't open, or if the school's too small, they're gonna do telehealth with that school. Those are great, but if you're having someone who's not embedded in your community come in and just do telehealth and not connect back to the, to the medical home for those students, then you're gonna end up splitting care. Um, and that doesn't sort of create this sort of wraparound need and make sure that the student needs are being followed up on and that it's consistent and that they're making sure that someone's supporting that student as they grow. Um, also, you want to make sure that it's comprehensive, right? That it's not just about first aid and dealing with what's happening right now, but that we're asking broader questions because young people aren't necessarily, especially adolescents, aren't going to bring forth all the other concerns that they're having, right? Like maybe they're having a stomach ache, but maybe that's about anxiety or maybe it's something that's happening at home or maybe they have a sexual or reproductive health need that they're not bringing forth. So you want to make sure that all telehealth providers are really comprehensive and are spending a lot of time with each young person to make sure that all their needs are getting met. And we do see some telehealth providers who aren't doing that. They're just sort of like very minimally focused on first aid or, or what the presenting problem is on that day and not um, building that relationship and keeping the, um, those young people, looking at all the needs of those young people. So we sort of want to give a word of caution there that people are using a lens also, some telehealth providers are actually asking um, schools to pay for their services, which is not how it should be working because in general, school-based health centers don't, aren't expecting schools to, um, to invest, right? They're, they're saying, can you help us with space? Can you help us with coordination? But the lead agency should be able to bill for their services. So if a, if a telehealth provider is coming in and saying, we want you to pay for this, then that's not a good sign. And we will talk more about financing now. Um, oh, Amy? Yeah. Amy, do you want to entertain some questions first before we get into this heavier topic? Sounds great. <laughs> okay, so we have four questions. Um, so the first one is, um, um, are school-based health centers open usually during, this, during school hours? If not, what are the policy challenges and ways to expand services? That is such a great question. Yes, um, in general, they are open during school hours and usually beyond, um, a little bit maybe on the earlier side so that students and um, community members can come before school starts and ideally some a little bit on the end side too so that people can come after school or like maybe a mom is bringing a younger student that doesn't go to that school they can come after school so ideally they're they're open not only school hours but a little bit more um, same with summer and breaks that ideally they have some hours there as well so that students who know who feel like they can get their services there consistently know that they can come back and still get them even during summer and on breaks or at least that there's a referral back to the lead agency so that even if they can't go to the school-based health center 
to see their nurse practitioner, they know that their nurse practitioner works at their the main clinic down the street and they can go there during the summer or on holiday breaks. So great questions. It does bring up, as you may um, guess, if, especially if you're coming from an education lens, it brings up this question of like, well, what does it mean for students to miss class? Um, and that's one of the places where there can be a little bit of a mismatch between school perspective and healthcare perspective, um, which is, you know, students will need to miss class in order to keep the school based customer sustainable. But if you think about it, if they had to be picked up by their parent and drive all the way to the doctor or the dentist, be seen, and then maybe not even be driven back, because I know as a parent, if I'm going to take my kid to the dentist and there's just an hour of school left, I'm not going to drive them all the way back to school just for that last hour of school. So even though they are missing some seat time for that appointment in the school-based health center, they're missing less than they would miss if they were going to an external provider. Um, also, that school-based health center staff can work carefully with school staff to try to pick the least important academic classes, or you know, like if we know that Johnny is failing math, then they're careful not to take him out of math um, or take him out of the same class. You know, because if they're going to therapy once a week, then that's a lot of missing class. So they can try to pull them from different classes. Basically, the school-based health center staff can try to work with the school to minimize the impact on that particular young person. Yeah, I want to add, Amy, that um, I know for mental health services, um, sometimes when the referrals are made, um, the student's school schedule is stapled to that referral form. Um, so that way it makes it easier for the clinician to go ahead and look and say, okay, I'm going to try to pull the student out of this particular class versus that particular class. Um, and yeah, and um, I'm going to go on to, and read the second question. Um, in the case where community health centers run a school-based health center for a school district, do school employees work at the school-based health centers in any, in any capacity or is it fully staffed by community health centers? I love these questions. Yes, yeah, such a good, good question. Um, the models really vary, but oftentimes there are school staff working side by side with staff from out external agencies. So you might have a school mental health provider, a school um, academic counselor, a school nurse. Um, you might have a school staff working. It does bring up questions about um, sharing information. So you have to have really clear MOUs and really clear agreements and consents. But yes, oftentimes those folks are working side by side. Yeah, I remember at San Fernando School Based Health Center, they actually had a um, school nurse co located with their school based health center. So the school nurse is a real um, partner and she mm -hmm. actually um, helped, you know, check students in and make sure that they go back to class with their appropriate pass and what have you. And I remember years ago, um, Long Beach, um, there was a school based health center that was actually operated by FQHC. And the FQHC actually hired the school nurse on a per diem basis. I want to say like two hours a month. So that way she can wear the uh, FERPA and the HIPAA hat. And I thought that was kind of an innovative um, approach to really, you know, addressing the confidentiality issues. And so, um, you know, she was still a full-time um, school nurse, but just sort of had that additional uh, two hours, you know, a month for the FQHC. Yeah, um, okay, the next, uh, yeah, go ahead. That coordination, I think where there's a will, there's a way. And if everyone's coming together to try and say, how do we best work together in the best interest of these students? Like, I think it goes really far. Yeah. The third question, Amy, is what are some of the best ways to engage younger students, particularly in K-8, K-8 through schools? That's a great question. Um, and one of the, um, the biggest questions we get in terms of sort of youth engagement. Um, I mean, a lot of, especially the K through five uh, healthcare does go through parents, right? Like um, most of the parents want to be present and understandably during dental visits and vaccine visits and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of that is more family work rather than just kids. But I think there's lots of really fun health education that can happen even in K-5, um, you know, oral health, the importance of brushing and flossing and, um, you know, with the little kids, it could be so much more fun to do that kind of education. Um, and even peer education can happen at that age. Um, and then in the middle schools, we really see some great sort of like beginning to build ownership over um, one like young people's own health and having them think about that's when, you know, oftentimes schools are doing the school sponsored health education um, in health classes and and a great time for young people to start thinking about how to take care of their own health and puberty and all the things that come up in middle school. Yeah, um, a few more, and these are really great questions, and we, we get them a lot when we do these kinds of um, sessions. Um, how do you handle follow-up care? Students have their own providers, but may come to the clinic not feeling well. How do you handle those visits as an FQHC? 
Mm-hmm. That's a great question. Well, we can dive into this with financing, but one thing that people often don't know is that FQHCs can see patients that are outside of their panel under medic under managed care Medi-Cal. So if an, an FQHC run school based health center is having a visit with the young person, even though they have an assigned provider elsewhere, they can bill for that service, um, which really helps with sustainability. And then it's really important to do that, like you said, that follow up and making sure that that communication circles back. So oftentimes a school based health center is run by the the you know most prominent FQHC in the community, especially in small communities. So that makes it really easy, right? Because you have your FQ main clinic and then you have your outpost school based health center. So those medical records are, are being um, continually like shared and, and circled back so that when you know Johnny goes to the school based health center because he has a, a mild asthma attack that that shows up in his health records so that when he goes next for his physical with his primary care provider, they see that. Um, but if the FQ is run by, if the school-based health center is run by a different FQ, it's important to have that information sharing in place and get that information back to their their main medical provider. Sometimes also families choose to switch their, um, to have their main medical provider at the school-based health center or at that lead agency so that they can keep seeing that, um, that same provider. Because as we know, many of the school-based health center providers are some of the most sort of kid-friendly and adolescent-friendly and loving medical providers because they're, they're drawn to the school-based work for that reason. Yeah, and I want to say, um, I think for some of the sites, they, you know, maybe they have um, part of their MOU, a, a system set up to provide courtesy care, you know, maybe up to like one or two visits if the student isn't going to switch over. Um, but yeah, I think that can be handled uh, depending on what the school policy is. Um, another question, um, and I know we have our vision to reality toolkit for this. Um, can you provide examples of strong MOUs? Yes, in fact, we are, I'll talk about this in a second, but we are um, redoing our main startup toolkit and adding lots more examples of MOUs. There's one or two in the existing version, and then many more are going to be on our website in the next month or two, so we can direct you to those. In fact, saying if you get a second, maybe you can chat the VTR link just so people can Sure. You know. Okay, I'll do that. Um, I'll just pose uh, the final two questions. Sorry, they just keep coming in, but this is no, great. great. I want you to go back to your slides, um, but yeah. I think these are important. Um, the next one is using the map that you showed earlier, there are many counties in the North State above the Bay Area that are without school-based health centers. How can California support the expansion of school-based health centers to these counties, which are also chronically underserved? Yes, I love that question. And in fact, I will talk for a second about some of the new funding that's coming out from the state and the federal government specifically for school-based health centers. Um, but that's part of what we all can be doing is advocating for that funding to come and to be distributed. Um, and then advocating in that county is to say, these are things that we need for our young people. Let's figure out how to get that funding to get them started. Absolutely agreed. Yeah. Um, and then an, another question is, um, one of our biggest dilemmas right now is being able to provide care for students who have Kaiser insurance and do not qualify for Medi-Cal but can't get adequate mental health care through Kaiser. Any advice on being able to serve them and get reimbursed? Yes, <laughs> we hear this a lot. Um, and one thing is I'll direct you to, um, there's a, if you're an FQHC, we have a workshop specifically on billing for behavioral health services as an FQHC, and we have a new, in fact, I think I have a slide that shows right here. We have a new um, um, toolkit specifically around sustaining and growing behavioral health services as an FQHC. Um, but one thing is Medi-Cal minor consent does have a behavioral health services carve out. Um, the young person does need to be seen under their own consent, and there needs to be a pretty high acuity that the um, clinician has to attest to. So it's not, you know, not all young people are eligible for it, um, but it is one possibility, um, especially for kids with really high need. Um, also, I think we all are trying to advocate with Kaiser that, you know, they do not have necessarily enough behavioral health services for the young people that need them. And so um, working with them to try to be able to bill in school-based health centers as a different agency. Sometimes different counties do have um, sort of carve-outs so the, the family can advocate to say, hey, we want to be seen elsewhere. Do you have any way to do that? And then the FQ can apply to be um, part of like the, the managed care behavioral health system. Um, so yeah, I recommend looking at this toolkit and going to that workshop for more information. 
Okay. And let me just, um, before you return to the slides, Amy, let me just put in a shameless plug. <laughs> About three slides ago, you had something on um, just, you know, partnership cultivation, you know, particularly with the schools of your uh, FQHC or any other community partner. Um, I was with the LA Trust for about 10 years, and we actually worked on a school health integration tool. Um, so we're happy to get that out and disseminate that. It's We believe it's the first of its kind in school-based healthcare to really um, have schools and, and clinic partners use that to measure how integrated are you and the tool itself is broken into five domains um, health authority integrated programming marketing and recruitment shared outcomes and staff collaboration and it was actually just published um in the journal of school health last month and so we'll go ahead and add that to a resource as well but i think you know for some of you who've been doing school-based healthcare for a long time you know this is a great time to start getting that baseline data to see how are you doing maybe you're super you know um uh, integrated, or perhaps you thought you were, but you know, um, uh, you know, th this is actually a validated tool to really start to make that assessment and um, strive for, you know, I think um, a closer or better integration. Okay, back to you on the finance. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> No, that's great. Thank you so much, Shay. And yes, let's check that resource as well. And and just so you don't feel like you're frantically writing things down, all of these resources are on our website. And all of these resources are available and we are here for you at CSHA. Like this is why we exist. So if you hear about something and then you go to the website and you can't find it, you can just email me and or and or saying and we will um, find it for you and have a conversation with you and track it down. Like This is the work that we want to provide to you all. So this is not a one time offer. Um, OK, so let's talk about financing briefly because it's really important. Um, as a baseline, I would like to say this isn't always true but generally once a school-based health center is built we think that it can be sustainable um, through partnerships so if you have different partnerships that are all billing their own different sort of billing tracks that they can bill for their services and sustain the services in a school-based health center that's you know that that's a broad generalization it's not 100 percent true but generally it's true so if you can get the money that you need to build it then we can help you make sure that it's sustained um, so you don't need sort of ongoing funding um, how they are financed depends really on the, primarily on what kind of lead agency it is, because of course, federally qualified health centers can bill for medical services, um, but school districts have different kinds of Medi-Cal that they can bill specifically for LEAs. Community-based mental health agencies have contracts with the county and they can bill for mental health services. So different kinds of agencies bill differently. Um, but in general, school-based health centers are financed by reimbursement through Medi-Cal, through health plans, through Family Pact, which is a special carve-out for pregnancy prevention, through the Child Health the Disability Prevention Program, which is sort of like an entry point into Medi-Cal, which is luckily less um, essential now that most young people already have Medi-Cal, and then for contracts for mental health services. Also, school district contributions, in-kind supportive spaces, and nurses, and utilities, and custodians. Um, and then sponsoring agency contributions or subsidies, and then government or private grants. So those are sort of the, it's a braided kind of funding and you pull it all together and it works. Um, like I said, there is this sort of initial investment, however, that needs to be made to get the actual facility built. Um, and just the sort of starting point that there's really different ways to do this that can range from really expensive and big and beautiful to not so expensive and not so big and beautiful. And I'll give you some examples of those. Um, but also some of the ways that facility funding does happen are through school modernization and construction grants, local bond measures, and then federal and foundation grants. And I actually have some, um, some images for you. So this is a mobile, this is a particularly fancy mobile unit, but it's awesome. And you can see it, it drives around from school to school and it has operatories in it. Um, and then I have another video. Um, I think I even have two quick videos. This is a one minute video that shows you a brand new, um, oh, sorry, didn't realize by, a brand new school-based health center um, in Madeira at Matilda Torres High School that this is sort of like, if you have all the money in the world, this is what you build. And, and we love Cameron Health for their investment in school health. So here's what a, a, a brand new fancy one looks like.
So I love that um, because um, Camerina Health has really invested in school-based health centers and you can see that they, um, I, I want to say that they've built two in the last couple of years and one was around 1 million and one was around 2 million. Um, but so, you know, those are no joke. And you can see they had multiple dental operatories, multiple exam rooms, multiple counseling spaces, all kinds of things. Um, but let me show you a different one that is actually built out of just a portable unit. It's been around for years. Um, it is, you know, not so fancy and much more affordable, but still manages to be really welcoming. So here's another like minute long clip. In Oakland, let's take a look around. When you first get to the clinics, you will need to call in order to be let in. Once you call, you will be met at the door by a staff member dressed in this funny gear that is meant to protect everyone from COVID-19. They will ask you a few questions about COVID and take your temperature before bringing you into the clinic. Once you get inside, the front desk staff will help check you in for your appointment. Welcome to La Clinica. Once checked in, if you are here for services related to your physical health, the medical assistant will bring you back to an exam room like this one. They will take your temperature, blood pressure, measure you, and ask you a few questions about why you are here. If you need to do any labs, you will go to the bathroom and place your urine test here. Then a provider like this one will see you. They can be your primary care physician and provide your yearly checkups, offer any vaccines you need, and see you for any sick visits. All you need is permission from a parent or guardian. During shelter in place, we are offering visits over the phone and video or in person if need be. So I will pause that there. Um, I, we have links to all these videos that we can also send out if you want to see um, the spaces. But just to give you a, a chance to see that clinic um, was from a portable classroom that's, like I said, you know, over 20 years old. Um, the the really the only investment that it takes to turn a big portable classroom into a clinic is the plumbing so making sure you have obviously you need sinks in the exam room and a restroom um, but so they can really flex from really big and nice and fancy and expensive to still being you know getting the job done that clinic sees uh, probably more than 25 students a day between medical um, behavioral health and um, health education so don't feel like you have to have the fancy version to do good work um, so we said we would talk for a second about new state funding, and this is not my expertise, but we do have another workshop this afternoon, um, the policy update from my colleague Lisa, who's talking about all these different new state funding options. Um, unfortunately, none of them are specifically about school-based health centers, but they all could be applied to school-based health centers. There's um, a behavioral health incentive program that's going through the health plans. So we're hoping the health plans will invest in school based health centers. There's community school partnership programs to start and expand community schools, which can also apply to school based health centers, um, school linked behavioral health partnerships, and then behavioral health infrastructure grants. So all this money is coming through the state government into schools and behavioral health and um, services to, to launch these new programs and services over the next couple of years. And so we think much of that funding can be leveraged to start new, start and expand school voice health centers to provide more services. And like I said, I think that after that workshop is this afternoon. So um, check that one out for more information. And then, as I mentioned already, the, um, the our new toolkit is specifically about how to sustain behavioral health services sort of clinically and administratively and through contracts all the different strategies to build for behavioral health services at a school-based health center, because we know that behavioral health is one of the deepest, most untapped needs. So we wanna be able to maximize that billing so we can keep expanding services to build more, to expand services more, to build more, to expand services more. Um, and then, you know, sort of where do you go from here? Um, if you haven't heard us announce this already, we have this new student health index, which is this amazing sort of online portal where you can go into your region, into your county, into your district, and find the schools that have the deepest need for school health centers that don't already have one. Um, we have our vision to reality toolkit that we were discussing earlier that Sam's going to chat the link to, and we have a new version with more downloadable tools coming out in the next month or two. And then we have just sort of the first steps to start planning your school based health centers, how you might form a planning committee, how you might do a needs and strengths assessment, how you might start identifying potential partners, and then think about how you're going to fund your facility. 
And then I said this before, but I'll say it again. We are really, the whole purpose of our existence is to help you start and sustain school-based health centers. So if you are trying to do that, please, please reach out to us and we will help figure out what we can offer, what we can send you, what kind of meetings we can help you hold, what kind of training that we can provide, how we can tell you about the funding that exists, all of the things because we want to, we want to help you accomplish that. And then there's my email, um, A Ranger. Also, I'm on the website. And I think the perfect timing because we have a few minutes left for any questions that didn't get answered. Is that right, saying we're stopping? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Amy. Another question came here. And we're, we're doing good on time. We have 14 minutes left. Um, if we open under minor consent, can we still do family work? Um, yes. In fact, you don't have to open under either. Um, within your scope of practice, you can do both minor consent and work with both kids and families under parental consent. And we suggest that it's actually important to do both, that you don't want to open a clinic and then turn kids away who are coming from minor consent, and vice versa. You don't want to open a clinic and then turn people away who need their basic medical care. So um, what we suggest is opening a clinic, getting parental consent for all services that would fall under parental consent, and then letting young people know that they can also come to you without their parental consent for sexual and reproductive health services and for some behavioral health services. Of course, of course, it's a best practice to talk to that young, to talk to young people about why they want to include their parents and families in, you know, decisions around sexuality and birth control and STIs and all of the things that are covered under minor consent. Of course, ideally, we want young people to be talking to trusted adults in their lives about that. But we also really want to make sure that they know that they can come into the clinic without having to let their parents know and without having to get that consent from their parents. So absolutely, you want both and. Yeah, I just want to mention too that um, minor consent as a topic is a great training topic for school staff. Um, I know we've done that in Los Angeles um, because you know we don't want students to get stopped and have and be asked, you know, why are you you know walking into the school based health center or the wellness center? Um, and I think um, and that helps you know I think the school staff recognize that this is a state law and that we want young people to be able to you know exercise their rights you know in a in a way that isn't gonna you know um, ostracize them you know as they're trying to seek these services so it's a, it's a good topic for for everyone but particularly school staff absolutely and parents parents often need to be educated too because um, i think it's new to them the fact that young people have this right absolutely i, I want to say i think uh my my sister when her son turned um 12 i said oh great he's now of minor consent age and i think she just was like <laughs> almost wanted to wring my neck for reminding her <laughs> anyway <laughs> that was my notion of what the 12 year old is right. um, questions from the audience go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to ask a question verbally i don't know that they can actually in this platform they might have to chat it Oh, okay. Oh, you know what? There's another question that came in. Um, how is it determined, decided um, to become a community-facing SPHC versus a non-community-facing? Can community members access services if not community-facing? And you can respond and I can chime in about our wellness centers in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a lot of it depends on the planning process in the beginning, right? Um, some of it depends on where the school-based health center is located on the campus. We often suggest that folks go ahead and put their school-based health center, if they have the choice, on that sort of outside periphery with a community-facing entrance, because at least that gives you the option of having communities come in and not have to sort of go through the school campus to get there. Um, and then a lot of it will depend on the lead agency and what they can accommodate, right? Like if it's a, if they only have pediatric staff, they might not be able to see adults or um, babies under the age of three, maybe, but they might be able to see kids from three to 25. And then just in terms of capacity, you want to make sure that the school-based health center can see the students and that the community doesn't sort of fill up all the appointment slots, but you also want to make sure that you have a big enough patient base to keep the, the clinic sustainable and keep the clinicians busy, right? If you have a, a nurse practitioner or a pediatrician there four days a week for eight hours a day, that's a lot of patients to see. And so depending on how big your school is and how deep the need is, you might need to supplement the patient base beyond just the students. And actually saying I did want to say before you talk about the LA trust model or the LA model of wellness centers mm -hmm. that people use the term wellness centers and school based health centers interchangeably and to mean different things so in different regions 
wellness centers might include more medical services and be, and, and be more interdisciplinary than a school-based health center. In other places, wellness centers are focused more on behavioral health and don't necessarily have the medical services as robustly. So different districts and regions might use those terms in different ways. We try to use them interchangeably and say that, you know, the idea is to bring health services to schools and the idea is to have as many kinds of services as possible. Um, we like the idea, we know that behavioral health is a deep need, maybe the deepest need. So we like the idea of that being at the center of the services, but we also know that students have unmet medical needs, social determinants of health, case management, sexual and reproductive health, dental needs. So as those other services can also be integrated, we think the, the more integration, the more services, the stronger the, the health center is going to be. But yes, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, Olivia, I think your question about how it's determined, I think it really comes down to the community, right? When you're putting together your planning committee, that, you know, usually, usually ideally would involve school, community members, parents, students. And I think those decisions come from, you know, that level of engagement to say what is really best for our community. Um, for the wellness centers in Los Angeles, um, like Amy said, uh, you know, th these sites are actually... Um, uh, position sort of on the outer perimeter of campus so that way they can actually have students access from the school grounds but then also have community access from um, the street side and and for some that are larger they actually have two waiting rooms um, one for sort of the general public and then one for students um, and the one for students tend to be perhaps a little bit smaller but there, there's a site in, um, in in the valley that actually had their youth advisory board decorate the waiting room um, for the for the student waiting room to you know to their own liking color furniture design and what have you. Um, the other thing about I think what Amy said about making sure that you know your school based health center will still really see um, you know the adult patient, which is kind of the focus of school based health centers, is that sometimes they'll set aside teen only hours. You know, so maybe like on a Tuesday, Thursday or one day a week or something, um, you know, students can access the school based health center um, whenever it's open, but also, you know, designate hours that are only for teens. So that way they feel like they can come and they're not going to see Aunt Martha, you know, if they're in a, in a shared waiting room. Um, and so I think really um, involving your youth advisory board your student advisory board and a lot of these decision making, I think will will keep, uh, I think, the school-based health center model front and center to your decision making and how you wish to operate, while, the, while at the same time trying to be responsive to the needs of the local community. Um, you know, we are trying to um, really have school-based health centers, you know, deliver care from that population health model, and that does involve, you know, the whole family, but at the same time, you know, I'm a, I'm a more traditionalist, I think, when it comes to school-based health center. I think it's really um, I think, you know, that it should really be designed to keep uh, adolescents, I think, front and center, uh, because I think that's really what the model calls for when we think about the role of, um, you know, healthcare services, mental health services in the context of academic achievement. Um, yeah, so, um, oh, let me read another question. Um, what suggestion do you have for leading an existing school-based health center that has a strong community-facing presence toward more enhanced school integration? Well, I'm going to refer you back to Singh's brilliant school integration tool because <laughs> that gives you a whole checklist to sort of go through different ways that you're integrating. Um, but I think making sure that you really have that coordination happening and that like built in structures for coordination. So having a designated point person at the school, whether it's, you know, um, a school administrator, an AP, someone, a school counselor, and then someone at the clinic who are coming together regularly to say, how can we do this better? Like, how can we make sure that, that teachers know what we do here? Can we do a tour? Sometimes at the beginning of the school year, even before the students come, they'll have like a come and get, you know, cookies and tea and walk around the clinic and meet the clinic staff. Sometimes they'll do a report back mid-year to say, this is how many students we've seen and what we've seen them for, obviously not with names attached, but you know, we've had this many pregnancy tests and this many counseling visits and this many sports physicals um, and asking teachers what they're seeing with students and what they think students most need so that the, the health center could be providing those needs. You know, sometimes things will just flare up and they'll be like, oh, we have a lot more discussion of, you know, um, smoking this, this, you know, this kind of weed with this kind of whatever and, and we need to do some workshops on it or, or girls will more fights amongst girls and they need some sort of um, restorative justice circles or anti-bullying workshops or you know, whatever it might be that's coming up, then, then the clinicians, whether they're medical providers or behavioral health providers, can come and say, oh, great, let me lend some support and some expertise to this issue and help you figure out how to resolve it. 
Um, so those are some of the strategies. Yeah, and just to um, add to that, I think a great start is, you know, either at the end of the school year or before the beginning of the school year, you know, convene a meeting with your school principal and have um, your stakeholders or a small group of people first, you know, sit with the school principal and, and complete the school health integration tool, because then you're really able to um, bring the important voices together to say, okay, let's actually assess how we are in doing this. And then, um, and then perhaps pick out, um, you know, the top scoring item, there's 12 items in this tool, the top scoring item, and then maybe the lowest scoring item and say, okay, for the top scoring item, let's, let's make sure we continue the good work that we're doing around this particular item, or and then for the lowest scoring item, you know, maybe put together uh, some sort of program improvement plan for the school year and, and, and recognize that this isn't just a one and one and done item that this will take, you know, ongoing collaboration. But I think being able to, again, use that tool as a basis to understand where you are and where you would like to go to, um, you know, or by the end of the school year, Year, I think is really helpful and and to know that you know you don't have to have a five you know zero to five scoring uh, five on every single item by the end of the school year that that's that's probably not feasible but it certainly it helps you think about um you know the, your partnership and really where to where to put you know put perhaps a little bit more effort um we have three minutes remaining 